In the second chapter of this MOOC, we have examined two important issues, the legal sources and the subjects of IHL. Our guest expert for this chapter is in very good position to comment on these uh, issues. Indeed, we have the pleasure to welcome Professor Robert Kolb, uh, professor at the University of, of Geneva, who is an expert not only in IHL but also in many other fields of international law. He has published many books on IHL, including this book to which we refer in the chapter and which pays particular attention to the legal sources of IHL. He has also published this study on the application of IHL to international organizations. So, Professor Kolb, many thanks for, for joining us, for having accepted to be part of this, uh, of this MOOC. And so I would like to ask you some questions on the issues that we addressed in this chapter. So we'll start with the first important source of, of ICHEL, the, the, the treaties. So in your view, what are the specific features of, of ICHEL treaties? Now let me notice, first of all, that IHL is one of the subject matters of international law which is most codified. There are few areas of international law, and to be perhaps more precise, there is no single area of international law apart human rights law which is as much codified as IHL. If you have a look into the site of the ICSC in the database of IHL, you will see a whole list of treaties and other texts which you can scroll down. It's quite impressive. The second remark is, why is this so? Why do you have so many treaties in this subject matter and less in other subject matters of international law? There are some distinctive reasons for that state of affairs. I'll just mention perhaps three of them. To be honest, there are a host of reasons, further ones, which would also explain why we have so many treaties. The first reason for having treaties is that you address yourself in IHL matters essentially to the army, to a whole series of persons in the armies of states who are not lawyers. And in order to address such pers persons with a certain effectiveness, you need to have black letter regulations which can be submitted to them, which can be read by them, and which can be worked over by them. Unwritten law, customary law is something very much for the lawyers. You have subtle problems of ascertaining the rules, interpreting them, which you don't have to the same degree with written rules, again, for persons who are not necessarily specialized not even specialized necessarily in IHL. That may seem strange that persons in the army are not specialized in IHL, but indeed most of them are absolutely not specialized in IHL. I see that constantly in the Swiss army. So all the more important it is to have treaties in order to be able to give them black on white the rules which apply. The second reason why we have treaties is that you should not forget, armed conflict is for the heat of combat, at least for a great part of it. In situations where you have armed conflicts and not peacetime, where you are, as I said, in the heat of combat, it is difficult to have unwritten rules, customary rules, which must be ascertained through complex procedures. In such emergency situations, you need to have, again, black letter rules which you can handle easily, which you can, um, how do you say in English, which you can uh, possess easily, which you can check easily. If you are seated in a tribunal during peacetime, you can make your researches. In armed conflict, you cannot do that. It's what we, we said, it's what we said in, the, in, the, in the course, in the chapter, precisely. We emphasize this, this aspect, so uh, just I mentioned this to the, to the students, so, but let's, let's, let's continue. <laughs> yes, a third, third reason among other ones why you have treaties in the context of armed conflicts is that you have very often technical matters to regulate in questions of armed conflict. You cannot have a uh, 
regulation for prison of war camps or for interned civilians, which would be based only on, uh, on unwritten rules. You need here detailed regulation, a regulation which is balanced, well balanced, and that supposes a process of writing down and of codification. Again, this is true also for occupied territories and the different rules on the administration of these territories or about uh, protecting civilian persons in occupied territories. You get into these matters, you get into such a detail of regulation where customary law is just not anymore very helpful. Customary law is helpful for the principles, for great and important rules of international law. The more you get into detailed regulation, the more you should do it with uh, written law, which allows you also to have some legal engineering and uh, pushing forwards the law sometimes to some extent by devising tailored and specific, specifically thought through regimes. So these are some reasons, among others, why treaties have such an importance since the beginning, since the very first times of modern IHL with the first wave of codification after 8064. 8064, as you know, the first Geneva Convention for the wounded and sick in land warfare. So, so thanks for, for, for these considerations which justify the, the role of, of treaties, the main role, the very important role of, of treaties in, in, in regulating armed conflict. So now let's turn to the, the second important, it's a very important uh, legal source in, in IHL, it's uh, customary law. And uh, so what are the, the roles? Because you say that treaties have very important roles in regulating armed conflict, so what are the roles? Are they only subsidiary, uh, supplementary roles uh, of, the, of custom in, in IHL? And, and so what are the main problems? I think there are important roles for customary law, but what are the, the problems also for, uh, re regarding the formation of customary uh, IHL? Let me take then the first part of the question and then later the second part. What are the main roles of customary law? Now, to some extent I told you why we have so many treaties and why treaties are valued if not cherished in IHL. But there are also some roles which the treaties cannot properly perform. And here, customary international law springs in. Again, there are a series of uh, assets customary international law brings to us in this subject matter. I may here perhaps just focus on the two ones which seem to me to be the most important ones. The first distinctive function of customary international law, and it is a quite obvious one, you know it, is that treaties are what international lawyers sometimes call particular international law. In other words, treaties bind the parties but do not bind third states. Hence, once you have treaties which are not universally ratified, such as additional protocol number one or additional protocol number two to the Geneva Conventions of 1977. But even, and that is often overlooked, even with treaties which are universally or almost universally ratified, like the Geneva Conventions number one to four of 90, 1949, even in this latter context, you have situations where the Geneva Conventions do not apply for lack of ratification or accession for the simple reason that when uh, you have new states emerging at a certain moment, these new states are not yet necessarily automatically bound by the Geneva Conventions unless you assume that there is universal succession in these conventions, but state practice is much less than clear on that. If you don't follow universal succession, the new state is not bound by uh, these Geneva Conventions for a certain time. And new states, as you know, emerge not really through secession, violence, warfare. In other words, exactly in a type of situation where IHL should be applied. Therefore, it occurs more than once that even for the Geneva Conventions, you are unable to apply them because one state has not ratified them. If you take the Eritrea-Ethiopian War, 1998-2000, you know that the Arbitration Commission under the Permanent Court of Arbitration could not apply the Geneva Conventions up to August 2000, so for the greatest part of, part of the war, for the simple reason that Eritrea had not yet ratified these conventions.
So you have situations where certain conventions cannot be applied in an armed conflict because one of the parties to the conflict, one belligerent, is not bound by these particular treaty, protocol or any other one. And in such a situation in international law, you always fall back on the common law. The common law being the customer international law, which has some differences with respect to treaty law because uh, some rules are only conventional and not also customary. But we can obviously say that the essential rules of IHL, especially also articles 48 and following of additional protocol number one concerning the protection of the civilian population in the conduct of hostilities, bombardment-like situations, these rules have been considered to be customary in the jurisprudence. Take as an example again the jurisprudence of the Eritrea-Ethiopian Claims Commission, so the arbitral commission for these two states, whose uh, arbitral awards have been published in the reports of International Arbitral Awards, Volume 26. That's the first function for customary law. The second one is that even if it may seem strange and odd, we have many conventions, but we still have gaps in the conventions. The law does not stand still, it has to evolute. Certain questions are clearly under addressed in the treaties. And here it is extremely difficult to have a development of treaty law because treaties are relatively immobile, if not very immobile. To modify formally a treaty, you must have, uh, in principle, the agreement of all the parties. Otherwise, you end up with a split up, some states ratifying the new um, amended version and other ones remaining parties only to the old treaty. To develop the law, very often you cannot do that through treaty devices and you need customary law. Be it a subsequent practice within the treaty, which is a customary phenomenon, be it very simply as customary law, general international law alongside the treaty and possibly also independently from it, but retroacting back on it. Take a simple example. On the law of non-international armed conflict, on almost all matters of that law, up to the beginning of the 1990s, you had a clear under-regulation in conventional law. You had Article 3 common to the four Geneva Conventions, which is short indeed, and you have some provisions in additional protocol number 2 of 1977, some provisions to be more precise, 19 articles in that convention, in that protocol, which substantively deal with issues of armed conflicts. Articles 20 and following are dealing with treaty law questions and do not address IHL issues. You have therefore as a whole in classical conventional law dealing with IHL generally and not with particular subject matters, you had 20 provisions for the law of non-international armed conflict and you had hundreds and hundreds for the law of international armed conflict. Most issues not being addressed at all in the context of NIAC, for instance, perfidy or other issues like reprisals, gaps. Here in the 1990s, you have had a tremendous development of the law with the criminal tribunals, in the first place, the tribunal former Yugoslavia, but also other ones, and through practice. The ICSC already in its customary law study could find that a series of rules had become customary, for instance, in the conduct of hostilities in non-international armed conflict. And this practice has been going on since then and is reflected also partly in the war crimes provisions of the ICC in the statute Article 8, 1998. That is a second function. In other words, the customary law is mobile law. It allows the treaty law, which lags behind in time, to be adapted to new needs with a greater flexibility than the treaty could be revised itself. These are two distinctive functions, roles and assets customary law brings to us. Now, the second part of the question is what are the main problems regarding the formation of customary IHL? Now here, if I take the matter generally, but I shall not be too long either, you have two series of problems. The one is more factual, political or sociological, and the other one is more legal, both being to some extent intertwined.
The political problem is that the formation of customary law on sensitive issues of protection of persons, civilians, on uh, the use of certain weapons which are militarily useful and so on. These questions are extremely sensitive. They go to the heart of what are called the vital interests of states. The states have very, very divergent interests. If you just take the fight against terrorism, you see how many divergent interests collide. And hence, it is difficult on the political, sociological level to have a practice which is sufficiently uniform and which is sufficiently followed and to which the states want to commit themselves so that you can properly develop the law. From the legal point of view, the difficulties are then translating that political difficulty to a certain what is a common practice which is very often absent. And then there is a tendency, which is understandable, in order not to leave gearing gaps, gaps to give some more weight to opinio juris, to give some more weight to what the states say rather than what they do, because on what they do it is difficult to ascertain a sufficient pattern of conduct. And then you slide very often towards uh, a customary law of opinion, if I may say so, a customary law of civilization, where you try to say that certain rules must be followed because it is right to follow them and because states have made some general statements, general statements sometimes in some assemblies, and therefore you, you try to take them on the word rather than on the deeds. You have a famous paragraph in the Tadic case of 1995, ICTY. I have now a doubt if it's paragraph 117 or 119, but you can check that quite easily. It is one of, of, of these two. And there it is said in a sentence which is magnificent for a lawyer. It is said what is inhuman in an international armed conflict cannot but be inhuman in a non-international armed conflict. The logic being, and therefore it should be prohibited in both. If you follow this type of approach, you have some type of creative customary law where opinion sometimes can prevail or at least fill in the gap of an uncertain practice. And it is clear that on the other side you will have states which are often belligerents, like the US, which will challenge this type of interpretation, which has as a tendency of tying their hands, because it is the US which make military operations in the world. It is not Switzerland. Switzerland can live much more easily with, with such, such an interpretation than can the United States. Lastly, what is not really controversial, and I think rightly so, is that the Hague regulations of 1907, which as you know are still very important in two chapters, means and methods of warfare, in particular Article 23, as well as occupied territories, Articles 42 to 56. These provisions are all considered to reflect customary international law, and there is old authority for that. You may remember that the International Military Tribunal of Nuremberg told us that after the war. Hence, you have good authority for that. And for the Geneva Conventions, you have the Eritrea Ethiopia Claims Commission, which could not apply the Geneva Conventions and therefore had to ask itself if these conventions reflected customary law and to what extent they did so. And in an opening paragraph of all its uh, arbitral awards under the title Applicable Law, these claims commission, which is an arbitral tribunal, always found that the Geneva Conventions, in all their substantive provisions, therefore the provisions which are separate from the procedural ones or the treaty law provisions, the substantive provisions for the protection of persons were all of customary nature. And that is quite remarkable all the more since that tribunal was absolutely dominated by Anglo-Saxon lawyers. Anglo-Saxon lawyers who are often more reticent to admit a uh, generous customary international law. So these are some problems you have in this area of uh, international law. So many, many thanks for those considerations. I think that they are, they are in line with what we said in the course uh, uh, concerning the roles. Of course, you mentioned the, the gap-filling role of, 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 of custom in, in IHL.
and also about uh, state practice, the problem of identifying uh, the practice for establishing customary IHL. And, and you say that uh, uh, we, we focus more on what uh, states say than what they, they do. And you said maybe we focus more on opinion juris of the states. But just a sub-question, just to ask you, if, do, do you think that what states say, it's, it's, it means that th that's their opinion juris? The, the, the verbal practice is a kind of opinion juris? Uh, for establishing a, cust a customary law? Yeah, you see, now the question is obviously to what extent when states make utterances in conferences, in the General Assembly, in the CWC uh, context or Conventional Weapons Convention Conference, when they make statements there, how do you interpret them? You can obviously say that statements are also practice and uh, you have international lawyers who consider that under customary law practice is not limited to material acts but encompasses also declarations, verbal practice, as, as it is called. If you follow this view, then uh, you don't have here only opinio juris, but you have already practice. It is just verbal, but it is not less important than deeds. You don't have always to shoot to establish something. You can also do it by saying, in a certain sense. And you would, at the same time, in these statements, have somewhere a, a, an expression of the conviction that this is the legally correct position. This is quite civilized way of lawmaking. I was just suggesting that there is a certain tendency that's certainly not, it's not a tendency which is pervading, but there is a certain tendency since 10 20 years at least. And it is not the only area of international law where we have it. We have it also in human rights law to give some more weight to verbal elements, be their practice or be their opinio juris, on uh, actual practice on the battlefield. Since the latter is sometimes just not accessible, you have aspects of uh, secrecy because these are sensitive questions, as you all know, or the practice is too split and therefore it's difficult to, to have uh, a clear practice in the sense of customary law, you see, which means uh, quite uniform practice, quite coherent practice, quite um, follow practice in time, that's difficult to establish in certain subject matters, especially again since the 11th September 2001, where we have had also quite hysterical reactions. It is therefore an area of the law where you have a certain specificity that you sometimes try to go more by opinion than by deeds. Yes, uh, it's in you mentioned uh, specificity. I think it's really about that in relation to, to IHL.